thank you very much for the invitation. I, I had one of those conversations this morning that makes you realise what an um, enormous gap there is between your working life and your personal life. I was telling my husband at breakfast that I had the toughest audience I've had for a long time that I was speaking to this morning. And um, he said, what's the topic of your presentation? And um, I said, it's who's afraid of the big, big bad mook? And he said, a mook? What's a mook? <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite a revelation <coughs> that I am trying to be critical of in a critiquing sense, not in a sense of being, being criticising. Um, is something that I obviously never mention at home, so I'll have to give him an education tonight that, um, that I'm not making up words, which is what he was fearing. Um, so this is a title that I, um, I borrowed from um, an overseas academic whose name I've neglected to write down, which is very bad form, but um, I thought it was a great title. So who's afraid of a big bad mook? Now, um, that's my Twitter username. Um, and I have been following yesterday and today on Twitter and I know that it's a very hard act to follow from this morning. I've seen that on Twitter also. Um, this is a photograph I actually took on my iPhone um, at Bondi Beach one afternoon. There were thousands of people on the beach and suddenly this storm cloud came over and people panicked, jumped up and down grabbed their towels and all the paraphernalia that you have when you go to the beach and rushed off the beach. Um, but I waited about 15 minutes and the storm blew over and it was restored to sunshine. Um, and then there were very few people left, so it was quite good for those of us who decided to wait it out. Um, so as Les said, I've been working in this area for a very long time. and. Um, and so what I wanted to do today was really talk about how much um, of what we're seeing with MOOCs is really a threat um, and is it really a game changer. Now my colleague DVCs and I often talk about the pressures that we're under from university councils who are extremely worried um, about MOOCs. They see all the headlines about MOOCs taking over <coughs> higher education as we know it all the work that Clayton Christensen has done on the disruptive technologies, the disruptive universities, um, really has, has university councils worried. So at UTS, we're in the middle of spending a billion dollars on our campus, um, right at a time um, when there's a lot of interest in um, online learning and what MOOCs might do and other forms of online learning. But I've been around for so long, um, even more than the 20 years I've been involved in this area, and, um, and looking at the ways in which people have seen technologies and what they might achieve and what really has and hasn't happened. Um, and I don't know if you've all seen this, this probably sums up everything about the history of technology. So it's a 1900s prediction for the way in which technology might be used in education in France. And the reason I think it's a great summary is it's, it really summarises most people's view that education is about taking content, turning it into a different form and transmitting it into the heads of the learners. It's a, it's a great cartoon, and you may have said it before, but I never tire of it, because it's such a, a fabulous summary. Um, but beyond 1900, we had um, things like teaching machines in the 1970s, and um, even before that, there was a, an automated multiple choice machine that um, dispensed a lolly if you got the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> they should bring those back. <laughs> Um, and I always remember seeing the first Macintosh, and some of you may remember that, how exciting it was. I was actually at EduTech last week, and they had one of these, and they completely re-engineered it, so it had a high-definition touch screen, and I walked past and did a double take before I realised they had to have re-engineered it. <coughs> but even though these new, different technologies come 
and go. The same claims have been made for the last 50 or 60 years that the fact that you've got that, that means students will be able to follow their own path of learning, work at their own pace, in their own time, using much richer materials with an automated measurement of their progress. Um, it will make teaching and learning more rich and more effective, expand time and place of education, better quality interaction and highly motivating for, um, for students and for teachers. And it doesn't really matter which technology you talk about, you see the same kind of claims. Um, Revolutionise society. And the exact same quote appeared a few years ago, but instead of personal computers, it was the information superhighway. And more recently, things like this headline, tweeting students get higher grades than others in classroom experiment. And the, the, the history of educational technology is just littered with these kinds of examples. Now, some years ago, I, um, I did a study of the, um, the content of articles in the higher education supplement that was back in the days when it was a whole lift out rather than the four pages that it is now. I didn't actually count the number of pages, which I should have in retrospect. Um, and the number of articles that related to the use of technology in education rose as people got more and more interested in, um, in how that could be used in education. <coughs> And I've just pulled out a couple of the great quotes um, about the predictions for technology. And people laughed at the time at, at um, statements like this, but now I'm not so sure. This is a great one. Um, this is when the UK was looking at launching its own e-uni. Nothing more interesting than a talking head. <laughs> Unless something's visual, I'll lose concentration. They should learn from the conference speakers and break up their talk with graphs. So that's why I put the graph in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the UK did actually go ahead, and luckily I kept a screenshot. Um, they spent 55 million pound on their e-university. I don't know how many people remember that. Um, and they, they projected a million students by the year 2013. So it launched in 2003, and their target number of students for that year was 6,000. In 2004, they had 900 students, and they shut it down. Um, but the UK were not alone. Um, there was some quite interesting work in um, other quite prestigious Universities. There was one collaboration called Fathom.com. It was Columbia, London School of Economics, Cambridge, British Library, the Smithsonian, New York Public Library, and so on. So they announced that they were going to launch this site to put courses on the web. And that's what the website looked like. And by 2003, after four years investing $30 million in Fathom, the universities all decided to call it quits. Now, it was the debate about what went wrong that I think is very interesting. They believed that the internet would expand at a certain rate and it didn't. Others said, well, that's a nice rationalisation, but students weren't willing to pay the price that were required to make the investment heavy initiative profitable. The New York Times wrote some interesting articles about it. Oops. The notion was that there were students out there for whom distance education was the answer. Um, and the university presidents got dollars in their eyes and figured that was the way that the university was going to ride the dot-com wave was through distance education. What went wrong? The business models were flawed. Um, so they're trying to make it work intellectually and then they have to figure out how to make it work financially. Is that start ringing any bells for what's going on right now? And then, of course, we had the arrival of the MOOCs. And I love this diagram 
of a MOOC because it, it shows the complexity of what we actually mean by MOOC. Is it an X MOOC or a C MOOC? Um, is it really open registration? Is it open content? Does it mean it's free? Um, what does a course mean? And so on. But however you describe it, um, there is m massive investment. I and mean, I know there was a huge amount going on in the 2000s um, in terms of online.com universities, but there's been an investment in, in these open online courses such that I've never seen. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the American Council on Education, Harvard and MIT putting in $60 million. But it, it's the same thing. They're trying to make it work and there's no really clear business model. But I think there might be one starting to emerge. And there was a statement that was made by Larry Summers, who was the former president of Harvard, that um, things take longer to happen than you think they will. And then they happen faster than you think they could. So my question today is that we've seen multiple waves over the last 50 or 60 years of people promising all kinds of things as a result of computers, the internet, multimedia, and back to the internet and free open and online courses. And so far, it hasn't actually happened. But our, what is the context in which we're operating and could that provide the tipping point that might be the game changer? So back to my um, storm cloud on Bondi. Um, the first thing that might cause a change is the increasing cost of higher education. The second is a decrease in government funding. The third is people starting to really question whether the investment in higher education is actually worth it. And finally, um, what we call a disaggregation of higher education. So starting um, with the cost of higher education, this is a report that's been put out by the Grattan Institute that's really questioning the fact that taxpayers are being asked to spend seven to eight billion dollars a year on higher education. And their argument is that it's mostly a private benefit. And so why should taxpayers be supporting those who are going to um, make it an enormous personal benefit from attending higher education? Their argument is that taxpayers should only be funding courses where there's a clear link to a public benefit. Um, and along came Alan Tudge. I don't know if any of you have come across him, but he's chairing um, a committee for Tony Abbott to advise the next government, and they're boldly saying that now, on how Australia can take advantage of the um, online higher education. So you can see that free open online education looks very attractive to a government who's, well, or even the one in power, um, who are coming in to, to look at how they can cut government spending. It looks very attractive. And I'll talk a little bit about um, the presentation I gave to Alan Tunch uh, in a minute. So these are some of the diagrams that were in the Grattan report, things like the, the billions of dollars that are being spent, and you can see that there has been an increase in funding after a real dip around 2003 and 4. Um, but if we were to get more up-to-date figures, we'd see that starting to go down again. And this is a very interesting figure of the um, help debt that's outstanding so in billions of dollars. So in 2012, it was up to about $25 billion in um, hex debt. Doesn't um, compare to the US where they've got $1 trillion in student loan debt, but it's quite significant. Um, so higher education has been the object of attention from a lot of groups. There was the Ernst & Young report that said quite similar things and they reported three ways only with, that, that universities could really survive. They had to streamline, become a niche operator, or become a transformer. Um, in, 
Now talking about um, disaggregation, this is quite an interesting analysis by Andrew Norton in his report that there are three um, particular things that students might want um, and the kinds of ways that education might be disaggregated to meet those needs. So one example is the undergraduate student coming into university straight from high school. So they might want the student lifestyle, they might want the credential, they might want evidence, social signals and so on. But if you take say a 30 to 35 year old person who might have been working in the health industry for a while but with no qualifications at all, might decide that they actually want a formal credential. They're not interested in the lifestyle or migration rights or any kind of social signal. They've got a particular need um, in terms of higher education. And of course, a couple of weeks ago, um, this announcement seemed to confirm um, some people's views that we are at the beginning of a massive disaggregation. When Georgia Tech decided or announced that they were going to offer a master's degree in computer science that on-campus students pay $40,000 for, um, but they're going to offer it online for $7,000. That's an 80% discount to only take a part of that degree. So no student lifestyle, no student support services, just the learning experience. And I think that is very significant and very interesting. Um, earlier in the year, um, the state of California announced that they were working on a deal with, um, I think it's Udacity, to um, allow their students to take those courses for credit. So the beginning of partnerships. A recent book called College Unbound by the editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education, so not one of those populist authors, but someone who's been writing for a while, talking about the idea that, that college is now um, no longer bound. So you no longer get students coming in taking just your whole course. They take a bit of your course and they'll take bits from everywhere else. <coughs> the um, third area that I raised was starting people starting to question whether the investment that they make in higher education is actually worth it. And although these figures are from the US, I'm starting to see evidence of um, a similar pattern in Australia. So the orange line there is the growth of university fees, and the darker line is the decline in um, average earnings for full-time workers that have a bachelor's degree. So if the cost of higher education is going up, and it's no longer the guaranteed meal ticket that it once was, and the salaries are going down, is it worth incurring that level of debt? Our Graduate Careers Australia launched its, um, its report and one of the interesting, we have a, a key performance indicator at UTS. I know a lot of people turn off as soon as they hear, hear that KPI, um, but the word KPI, but um, I have to report on this regularly to our council. One of our KPIs is graduate workplace success. And one of our lead indicators of that is the number of employers that come to our careers fair. And this year, the number of employers that came onto, onto our campus dropped, um, which has been very, it's very unusual. So we looked around and we found that not only did it drop at most other universities, but that some universities canceled their entire career fair um, because they didn't have enough employers. Um, so what do employers say? What's very interesting here is the rise in the number of employers that said that they weren't going to recruit any new graduates at all. And also a decrease in the number of employers that said they were going to employ more than 20 graduates. So you can see there's um, a bit of anxiety out there uh, in, in terms of who they're going to employ. I thought I'd just put these couple of slides in as well. Um, what they say the most important selection criteria, and I'm sure given this audience that you know this already, the number one was interpersonal and communication skills, um, which is important to the argument about um, whether we should be afraid of MOOCs. Um, passion, drive, commitment, attitude. 
critical reasoning, analytical skills, and the calibre of academic results was only number four. So it was those other skills that we might call the, the graduate attributes that were the most important. And in fact, that is exactly the argument that I made to Alan Tunch, um, that we hear Julia Gillard saying all the time when we see um, industries closed down and, and moving offshore, you hear her saying all the time, Australia can't compete on the cost of labour, so we have to be able to compete on the quality of labour. But where's the game plan for that? And I think this is actually what our game plan has to be. And this is where we need to be focusing, embedding these, even more uh, um, embedding these in the content of what our students are learning. Um, I'll skip over these, but some of the amusing stories that come out of this are students that turn up for interviews and quite happy to take mobile phone calls in the middle of the <laughs> interview. But some of them go out of the room when they come back in, they wonder where the panel's gone. <laughs> um, but I do, I do actually read all of the qualitative comments that our students make in the CEQ, and um, and uh, that in com in combination with what I hear from students on campus, what do they actually want? At the end of all this, let's ask the students what they actually want. And what they really want, they crave face-to-face -face interaction. They want engaging interactive classes, but they also want podcasts of them. They want much more face-to-face -face time with academics. They want more feedback and much faster turnaround on that feedback. Um, they want, where we're employing casual staff, they want them to be paid more so they can go to more things. They want much faster turnaround on email. <laughs> and UTS online questions or whatever is your learning management system <laughs> and they want us to bring back office hours. The problem is that big dollars to implement. So that's a significant challenge that we have. And despite what students say about wanting um, engaging interactive classes, or maybe I shouldn't use the word despite, we actually did an audit of all our rooms around campus and found that by the end of semester, we had about 31% um, of students attending classes. So either they're not engaging and interactive enough for them to attend, um, or they weren't being as honest as they might be. So I really like this quote by uh, Manuel Castells that the history of technology is that users are the key producers of any technology, and that they adapt it to their own uses and, and values and ultimately transform the technology itself. So we learn about the technologies by using it and producing and looking at the feedback between the way it's used and the way we enhance it. And that underpins um, the rest of what I'm going to say because there are interesting parallels um, between MOOCs and the evolution of the telephone and the way it's changed. As you know, it was invented in the late 1800s and the people who invented the technology tried to dictate um, how, how it should be used. Um, and it was actively, its use for social communication was actively discouraged. So the producers tell you how you have to use it. They made predictions about how it would be used. Um, foster world peace, I thought was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when, when people looked at um, adoption of the telephone, they found that other innovations were being adopted at a much faster rate than the telephone. And, um, and someone listened in on a sample of 3,000 telephone calls and then wrote an article that he was outraged to find that it was a high proportion of telephone calls that were nothing more than social chit-chat <laughs> and tried to start a campaign to stamp it out. <laughs> um, and as Claude Fisher said, really what happened is that Americans used it to pursue their characteristic ways of life. And that's exactly what I think is going to happen with MOOCs. We can't tell people how they're going to use it. They're going to find what's useful. And that will become um, the way in which it's used. 
Now, if you look at the patterns of enrolment, um, oh, and of course that's the current slogan. They finally listened to the, what users wanted to do, and now the slogan is reach out and touch someone. So if I've just been reading an evaluation of the, um, of the University of Edinburgh's venture into MOOCs, and it mirrors the same kind of pattern of other MOOCs in that by and large the people who are enrolling in them are not the undergraduate students. By and large they are people who already have a degree from either a, a community college, an undergraduate or a postgraduate de degree. So 85% of people that enrolled already have some level of education. Um, this this article in First Monday that appeared recently um, is providing evidence that there's no reason to believe that MOOCs are any less effective for learning experience than their face-to-face -face counterparts. I love that line. Um, but seriously, uh, just recently University World News, students flock to MOOCs to complement their studies and that's what I predict is the way in which people are going to be using MOOCs and finally, um, this, this is an interesting development that only happened a couple of weeks ago. But now that Coursera and edX and so on have got the technology right and figured out how to do an online course, they're now starting to look at the business model, just as what happened with Fathom all those years ago. And what is really interesting is that um, up until a few weeks ago, if you look at the fine print of the MOOCs, they say, that you may not enrol in a MOOC um, as part of a formal award course. So they have been specifically prohibiting the use of MOOCs um, to complement courses. And now they're turning around and saying they're going to explore collaborations on campus. And um, they're, they're doing that with 10, 10 universities um, in the US. So the statement that I really love to make all the time is that if all we're doing um, is replacing, um, if, if what we're doing is such that it can be replaced by a MOOC, then we should give it up. And we should give back the taxpayers' dollars. That what we should be providing on campus has to be qualitatively different to the kind of experience that students can have um, on a MOOC. So just to finish up with um, an example of what um, I've been working on here at UTS, like most universities our council has been very nervous about MOOCs and asking me when we're going to develop our MOOC and my response to that is if we're serious, if you're serious and you want us to go down that path, we need to halt all of our building work right now because we can't afford to do both. We can't afford to be a serious on-campus institution and be supporting MOOCs at the same time. But instead, I've come up with this strategy called Learning 2014. So in 2014, we're moving into three new buildings. Um, and I've been involved on the, as well as doing the refurbishments that Les spoke of, um, I've also been instrumental in the design of these new buildings and I've been courageous in the Sir Humphrey sense of courageous in that there's not a single standard lecture theatre in those new buildings. Um, it's all designed around a particular approach to learning. There are large, um, large collaborative rooms and I'll show you a picture of one in a minute, but there's not a single standard lecture theatre. So I've had to have a very thick skin because there are many people who are very upset about that. And I, my response always is, I can understand that. I love giving lectures myself. I love this. So I can stand up in front of everyone and I can show off how much I know. Um, you can't interrupt me, really, although I've got one Twitter message. Um, <laughs> The only problem is we know that students don't learn very much from this approach as the majority approach. So what I've tried to do is instead of um, talking about this from the perspective of teaching is try to talk about a general um, 
overview of what students need to do in order to learn. <coughs> so what I'm saying is that when students come in, they have particular learning goals and they have to be able to access ideas and the content of their learning. And it might be that they come onto our campus and they might go into one of our large collaborative spaces. Um, but before they come in, they may have watched um, videos or they may have used open education resources. But when they're in the large collaborative space, they'll be engaged in interactive learning experiences where they'll be practicing the, um, the kinds of, um, of graduate attributes that we're trying to get them to develop. But then they need opportunities to make sense of that loose collection of ideas that they've probably gained access to, to test out the ideas. And they need to be able to perform some kind of action to create meaning. So it might, it might be that they're talking with a mentor from industry. They might be doing a laboratory experiment. They might be going out to industry to do an internship. They might be traveling. We place a lot of store on students traveling. But then any kind of action without feedback is not a, is not a very gratifying experience. So they have to have opportunities to receive feedback. And it might be in group work um, which is either face-to-face -face or online. It might be talking with an academic. It might be using Facebook, Twitter, and so on. And then they need opportunities to reflect. So hopefully they spend some time sitting and thinking. They might be writing blogs. And they might be uh, writing assignments and so on. So this is what I think is the future of MOOCs. I don't think they're going to take over what we're doing, but I think we have to find ways, or we do at my university anyway, for the seamless integration of what's available online with face-to-face, -face, with the ultimate aim being um, that they are really getting a high, high value experience by paying the premium um, to come onto campus. Um, so, we're using techniques such as what we're calling flipped learning, which is where they're looking at these resources before they come onto campus. And this is one of our large collaborative spaces when I mentioned that we don't have a single standard lecture theatre. We now have these collaborative spaces, and I know some universities are putting these in as well, where you have two rows of desks with chairs on casters so that in the middle of the class the students can turn around and engage in an, in an exercise. Um, our engineering faculty has spent a lot of time and money creating these remote laboratories so that students can log in online and do experiments. I know you've been talking about simulations already this morning so I don't need to explain that. <coughs> We've had enormous successes um, with our peer learning. We often have the view that we personally have to be there for learning to happen. But if I had more time, I'd show you some graphs, and I'm sure you've all got them, of our UPASS um, work and the big difference it makes to students' learning. And finally, uh, group work. Um, so these are, these are the kinds of ways in which um, I'm not afraid of the MOOCs, and rather I'm quite excited about the way in which we might be able to use them to meet the expectations that students have, to really give academics the time that they need to do what students say, um, say that they want to do, and that they'll have a much um, higher quality education that will really position Australia to meet the really significant challenges it has um, as we go forward. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take questions. Presentation. Questions? Oh, well, I'll start the ball rolling. Thank you, Professor Alexander. Look, I am a little bit afraid of the MOOCs, and as the um, article in the University News said, I think there is a particular target on international masters um, coursework, and that will put a quite a dent in our university's income from that area. The one area that I do 
think we are at risk from MOOCs, and because I only had half an hour, I thought I'd just do a general overview. I think postgraduate education is at quite significant risk. Um, but I think it presents us, they say that you only, I think it was Thomas Kuhn, um, in the structure of scientific revolution, said that you really only get major change when there's an external threat. And so um, I think MOOCs actually provide that external threat to get us to turn around our thinking about what postgraduate education might be like. And um, the path that we're going down is looking at transdisciplinary education as a master's in the master's area. So it's not something that you can get on a MOOC. Um, I mean, how often can you engage in a learning experience where you start with a problem and you get people from different disciplines coming in and attacking it from, from different approaches, analysing it from different perspectives. I mean, that's really um, something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, but it's hard to get buy-in. The threat of the MOOC provides such an opportunity. So I see it as an opportunity. Uh, thank you very much for a very informative and, and enjoyable talk. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, my question is about the graph that you presented in terms of the uh, increase of the cost of education as compared to, uh, opposed to uh, the uh, decrease in the income. And what's the impact of that uh, in trying to build um, a clever country here and to really uh, move forward uh, in the next 20, 30 years? I, I absolutely agree. I, I'd love to try and get the data to produce a similar um, graph for Australia and I'm actually, I am working on that. And um, it's all the more reason why we have to do a lot better than we are doing right now in terms of the quality of the graduates that we are producing. Um, if employers are saying that they want people who can think critically, we've been saying that but I think we've become a bit self-satisfied. Um, are we, where's the evidence that we've been able to produce really good communicators, people who can think critically, work in teams and so on. It's often an add-on to a subject um, or people are put in groups and told to go and do an assignment, this is the worst of it, and then they just tick off group work as something that's been done. Um, so I think it's a real challenge. I don't have an answer to it other than we have to increase the quality of the experience that students have to try and ensure um, that they, they do uh, graduate <coughs> with those qualities so they're more employable and then they create a much better outcome in their organisations and we increase our productivity which increases everybody's salary. Thank you. Mark. Actually, thanks very much. To what extent do you think the uh, efforts from TEXA to require uh, uh, evidence about achievement of outcomes will support your endeavours to go down that graduate attributes route? I thought you were going to ask me whether TEXA is trying to stifle innovation, um, which I know <laughs> is a criticism that people are making, but it's absolutely unfounded. Okay. I'll just take this opportunity to give a little plug to TEXA. Um, I know the people who are trying to do something different say it doesn't meet their standards, but you only have to talk to Texa about what you're trying to do. Um, so, sorry, the question you were asking me was about this, them asking for evidence of standards. That can only help our cause. Run. So my, my comments, my, my question is more of a comment. I agree with everything you said, but I think the first thing that you said that's really important is to, when we talk about MOOCs, there's no real definition of what we're talking about. So, so when someone says, I've got the MOOC working, it, you'll find it's not a MOOC, it's a mock. Or, I, you know, so <laughs> I think because we use the word MOOC to mean so much, it's almost an implausible discussion to have, isn't it? Because it, it, it's a bit like talking about e-learning. It's such a big field that to try and narrow it makes it so difficult to work with. Yeah, yeah if, right. if, you, if you look at, going on that, if you look at the, where it's evolved, in the early days, am I, sorry, I got in. In the, early, in, the, in the early days, MIT kicked off open courseware, and there was a big open courseware consortium, which is not MOOCs because you couldn't do the courses, but the content's there. And so, in a way, what we should do in staff development is realise we've got this wonderful amount of content that we can then use 
to build into a discussion, to build in, and that's the cleverness. So yeah. there's all that stuff out there. I mean, content kills us. Well, we've got all that content there. Let's be clever in the way we use the open content. I agree. And I mean, my own critique of my own Learning 2014 model is that by by using the... Oh, this microphone's now working. It wasn't working before. No, I just turned it up. Uh, the, um, the model <laughs> of flipped learning, for example, is still predicated around lectures rather than actually turning learning on its head and really engaging people in more realistic activities and they build. But I think we perhaps can't go to there from where we are now and that maybe the Learning 2014 approach is a stepping stone but with the aim of moving towards simulations and much more learning, um, authentic learning experiences. We've got a question near the back. Yes. Um, I was um, reflecting on the one word you had there that you might want to um, elaborate on, which was disaggregation, because I think that the real opportunity or challenge that comes from MOOCs is something that was started by Open and Distance Education 30 years ago, but is rekindled by this media flurry around MOOCs, and that is uh, students having designer degrees where they take subjects or courses from different universities and the, um, the winner out of all this will be the universities who know how to handle assessment and credit transfer, assessment of, of subjects from other universities or content from other universities via MOOCs or whatever, and rec so a rekindling of the whole recognition of prior learning or PLA as it's called in the States. So under disaggregation, it's like the role of, of some teachers maybe to become expert assessors of portfolios of content from other universities mm. that no longer will content and the whole university experience be resident in one university. Mm. We have to work out how to make that experience a global experience for a, a graduate and, and harness that into your university so they get a UTS degree. That's so you right. might want to talk well, about we've, we've made an initial decision um, that we will look at um, giving credit to um, an authenticated certificate from a comparable course from one of the big four MOOCs, so edX, Coursera, Udacity and FutureLearn. Um, but I guess we'll move to a more uh, nuanced approach. But that's really what um, Jeff's book is about, College Unbound. It's about that very idea that people will do just bits and pieces um, from probably different the, the university policies, probably in Australia, are pretty much the same, except for distance unis, um, that we have a ruling that it's not a University of Wollongong degree unless you've done 75% of your subjects at Wollongong. That's mm. something we'll have to change if we want to, or be, be challenged or talked about, uh, in terms of what is the cre accreditation we're giving. What is a University of Wollongong degree if it's made up of more than 25% of subjects from somewhere else in the world? That's right. And there's always a trade-off between accumulating those bits of content and what I think is really the future, which is turning education on its head. And instead of building from beginner, intermediate to advanced, starting with the complexity and unpacking it in a sort of problem-based learning, inquiry-oriented simulations, it's very hard to bring little bits in. So we have to think about that in the course design as well. Uh, uh, uh. I think, we, I think this lady over here has had a hand up for a while. Can I just take that question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I love the pictures of your new collaborative learning spaces <laughs> and um, we've just built some at QUT as well. Yes, and I mean, they're amazing. Very Students very behave very differently in them. Staff have to behave differently in them. My problem is there are only some of them and my, all my teaching scheduled in the old-fashioned teaching spaces. I just wondered how important do you think it is that the space changes in order to compete effectively in well, Create Bio. Yeah. Um, if you have any time, I'd advise you to go down to the ground floor and walk along the length of it. And if you start at the end near the Entertainment Centre, that was our first Learning Spaces project. And walk right through to the end, which is one of our more recent ones. It's called the Green Space. Um, but every time we roll out a new refurbished space, it's immediately full and we then get complaints from students in other parts when are they going to have it. But once we open our new buildings next year, it will be quite ubiquitous. But one of the new spaces is a large flat floor space that accommodates about 120 students at tables of 10, each with their own computer and smart board and so on. 
and when it first opened, um, I got an irate email from an academic in engineering who said, Dear Shirley, I thought you were supposed to be an expert on learning spaces. This is the worst designed lecture theatre I've ever been. <laughs> I said, yes, it is the worst design lecture theatre you've ever been in. Um, but I did wander in one day. I saw someone who was just obviously uh, completing a class, and I went up to him and int I introduced myself by name, but not by title. Um, and he didn't react to the name, so I thought, great, he doesn't know who I am. And he said, oh, I'm only a casual. And I said, oh, I was involved in designing the space. I'm just interested to hear um, how you found it. And he said, well, I teach the same subject here and at another university. And the other university, I'm allocated a lecture theatre, so that's what I do, I give a lecture. But here, because I've got this space, I actually get the students working on real problems. And I go around the room helping them, and when they, they put up their designs on the screen and I share it with others, it was very obvious that the learning space had dictated the way in which he taught. So it made a big difference. There's, um, we've got a, a, space, a website um, called Learning 2014 on our website with lots of images and videos, so if you'd like to have a look at it, please do.